we are in a series titled, Life in the Favor of Jesus. You know you are in God's favor. Do you know God's favor is upon your life? Do you know Jesus wants to pour out rich blessings on you? And uh, it's just encouraging to know that. And one of the blessings that he has for us is the blessing of fellowship. I'd like to start as we talk about the value of fellowship by asking you this question. Who do you hang out with? Who do you hang out with? Think about your group just for a moment. Think about who you are spending time with. Think about who is in your circle. Here's what the Bible says. He who walks with the wise will be wise. But the companion of fools brings sorrows. He who walks with the wise will be wise. Yeah, God loves fellowship. The Bible also says how pleasant it is when brothers dwell together in unity. How pleasant it is, not brothers biological, how pleasant it is when Christian brothers and sisters hang out together and dwell together in unity. God loves fellowship. And there is so much value in fellowship that he wants us walking in it. In Hebrews, uh, God tells us not to forsake the assembling of, of ourselves together. That we might come together and to encourage one another. To stir up good gifts among each other. And all the more as we see the day approaching. How many of you know the world is getting crazier and crazier? And uh, that's no concerns. Uh, Charlie Campbell's going to come and talk to us about some of those. Hey, no concerns. The Lord holds it in his hands. He said these things were going to be happening. But as we see the day approaching, the day of Christ's return approaching, all the more we need to be assembling ourselves together and holding each other up and encouraging each other and dwelling together in unity. Ezra, one of my favorite people in the Bible, uh, Ezra said this, he said, I am a companion of all who fear God and delight in his commandments. In other words, yeah, I just love hanging out. I love spending time with those who fear the Lord and walk in his ways. And there is something special about fellowship. There is something that God has designed for us in fellowship that is rich, and he wants us to be tar partakers of it. Uh, we pick up our story in Galatians chapter 2, and we're picking up right where we left off. Here's what's happening. Uh, Paul had planted these churches, had some amazing fellowship with, with these guys in the, in the churches across Galatia, modern-day Turkey, planted churches all over. And, and then um, these, after he left, these Judaizers, which were... Uh, Jews who converted to Christianity but were trying to get everybody to go back to Judaism. They had come in and they had really given Paul a hard time. He had been beaten up by these guys. Uh, they had attacked him. They had gone into the churches and tried to dismantle the work that he did of setting up these churches where we're saved by grace and grace alone. Where we don't have to do anything to receive God's favor we already have God's favor in Jesus Christ. If you're here this morning and you're in Christ, may I just remind you of God's good favor on your life. And if you don't know Jesus, may I remind you of God's good favor on you because he's giving you time to come to Christ that you might know him, calling you into fellowship with his son, Jesus Christ. And so here's what we have. We have this God who has favor on us, but the Jews came in and said, uh, no, 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 you've got to go back to Judaism. You've got to be circumcised. You've got to keep these rules. You've got to keep these dietary things. And they put a, a bondage on God's people, and it broke Paul's heart. Not only that, they said, Paul, yeah, he's not that good a guy. He's not a real disciple. They attacked Paul personally. They attacked his ministry. And so it was a tough road for Paul. Paul was hurt, he was weary, and Jesus, knowing that Paul was fatigued, probably more than Paul did. Do you know Jesus knows you better than you know yourself? I, I often tell my wife, uh, baby, if I have an emotion, I'm the last one to know it sometimes. I mean, 
Uh, I get weary, and, and I'm sometimes the last one to know. I think Paul was probably that way. He was a type A driven guy, but Jesus knew he was fatigued. And he tells Paul something. He says, Paul, I want you to go to the Jerusalem, excuse me, go to Jerusalem and to hang out with the disciples. Look at verse 2 of chapter 2. I went up by revelation, by revelation of God. God had spoken to Paul. I went up by revelation and communicated with them, that's the, the church leaders in Jerusalem, all the good things that God was doing in his life. Yeah, Jesus knowing where Paul was, he says, Paul, I want you, and you're weary, you probably don't even know it, but I want you to go down and I want you to go hang out with the disciples in Jerusalem. And he encourages them and he, and he builds them up a little bit. And here we see how God knows what we need before we, we even do and how that fellowship encouraged them. Move forward to verse 9, kind of right where we left off last week. Look what happened. And when James, uh, that's the half-brother of Jesus... James the disciple had already been killed at this time. That's James the half-brother of Jesus. When James, Cephas, that's Peter, James, Peter, and John, who seemed to be pillars in the church, when they perceived the grace that had been given to me, Paul speaking, they gave me and Barnabas, say it with me, the right hand of fellowship. They took them in. And they said, oh man, this is good. We love what Jesus is doing in you. They gave us the right hand of fellowship, that we should go to the Gentiles and they to the circumcised. And they desired only that we should remember the poor, the very thing which I was also eager to do. Here's what happened. They said, hey, you are just like Ezra. We can see God working in you. We see God's hand upon your life. And we are stoked. And we extend the right hand of fellowship to you. We are blessed by what you're doing. This is an amazing work. And we want to support you. We want to encourage you. We want to lift you up. We want to help you. When it says they gave them the right hand of fellowship, that is an idiom for just saying they had all the favor all the blessings, all the support of the apostolic leaders. And when they gave them the right hand of fellowship, they brought them up before the whole church, and they prayed over them, and they asked the rest of the church to pray over Paul and Barnabas, and they supported them, and they sent them out on Paul and Barnabas' second missionary journey. And so how encouraging it must have been for Paul. How refreshing, how healing, how restorative, how inspiring for Paul to be brought into the fellowship and to receive the fellowship and support and encouragement of his brothers and sisters. I know in our Western culture, we have a mindset, (coughs) excuse me, we have a mindset of, I can do it on my own. Ha, ha, ha. I'm my own man. I don't need anything. Looking out for number one. Can I tell you what a crock that is? What a crock. We were meant to be in fellowship. It's how God designed us. And here Jesus, knowing that Paul needed restoration, look at this. What did Jesus do when Paul was weary, when Paul was fatigued? How did Jesus, the almighty Jesus, how did he choose to restore him? Did he send angels down from heaven that hovered around him and brought him supernatural food? No. What happened? Jesus said, Paul... I want you to go to Jerusalem and to hang out with the brothers. I want you to be in fellowship. I want you to experience the body life that you're missing out on right now. I want you to be uh, nourished by those guys. And I wonder, just, uh, you know, Paul was a great leader, but what might have happened to a fatigued and beaten up Paul if he was not refreshed? What might have happened if if 
Paul just grew weary from all the hassle that was going on and, and the attacks that were on. What might have happened? I don't know. I think Jesus would have preserved him. But here's what I do know. I do know I've seen multitudes of other weary leaders who aren't in fellowship, and we've watched them, haven't we, fall headlong into sin and ultimately destroy themselves because they weren't in the fellowship with their brothers and sisters that they needed to be in? The Bible says that a man who isolates himself seeks his own desires, and he rages against all wise judgment. Seeks his own desires. Fellowship is so important. And God, knowing where Paul is at, says, Paul, I want you to go in and I want you to get some fellowship. I want you to get some support. I want you to receive love. I want you to have all that is there for you in my church family. And here's really the first point. If you haven't got it already, it's on your screens. I just want you to hold on to this. Fellowship is one of God's main ways of restoring our weary souls. Fellowship is just God's way of lifting us up, of building us, of strengthening us. And godly fellowship restores the soul. It's important that we hold on to that. We've uh, really enjoyed some good fellowship over the summer, but I tell you what, I am looking forward to getting back into our mission groups on September 18th. As our groups regather together again and, and we have that fellowship, it's amazing. And God wants to use that fellowship that is there in the church to build us and to restore us and to strengthen us. We are designed by God to be in that kind of fellowship. And I want to use a term, if I may, uh, I'll define it. The term is gospel centered fellowship or gospel centered living. What does that mean? Uh, if I use it again later today, just well, let's hold on to this definition. Gospel-centered fellowship or gospel-centered living is just this. It's that I surround myself with friends and companions who are like-minded in Christ. Or in other words, who value humility and brokenness and the regenerative, restoring power of Jesus Christ. That we see ourselves not as perfect and amazing, but as broken and loved by Jesus Christ. By given new life by Jesus Christ. And there is a humility, there is a joy of that kind of living. Knowing and being with others who have a like mind that we want to go out and, and help others who are hurting. Help others who are broken. I remember it was a year ago uh, on the 17th that my son Nathan had his accident. And I remember one of the darkest days of my life when I come and I find out my son has a tremendous brain injury. And he might not make it. And the report of the doctors, even if he does make it, I don't know what kind of son you're going to have. And oh, how our hearts sank. And I remember the love and the fellowship of all of you was so powerful, so amazing, that it held Lisa and I up, and my boys, and my daughter, through the darkest time we had ever been through. Not only that, it was a tremendous testimony and a witness to the entire hospital and the entire San Diego County. We received literally tens of thousands, tens of thousands of hits and praise reports and praying, you know, saying we're praying for you. Just amazing. So much so that the whole hospital was going, what is going on? What is this? This is the love of Jesus Christ. It can't be found anywhere else. God wants us to have that. He wants us to walk in it. We are designed by God to be in gospel-centered fellowship. Built on forgiveness and grace and humility. And the power of Jesus Christ to even bring life from the dead. Amen? And oh, he did in my son's life. 
Oh, how I just, I, I can't even tell you how thankful I am on a regular basis. Fellowship is vital to our wellness, our wellness physically, our wellness spiritually, our wellness emotionally, our wellness mentally. It is so important to the whole of our wellness. It is so important that Jesus commissioned the church to be in constant fellowship. I have a verse for you on your screens, Acts chapter 2. Read this with me, will you, in a, in a booming voice. I'd love to hear you. We've got uh, a good group here, uh, some on vacation, but the, you know, still a great group here. Let's do this in unity together, one booming voice. They continued steadfastly. No, 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 no. I want to really hear you. Let's make the windows rattle, please. They continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine, in fellowship, in breaking of bread, and in prayers. Man, you sound so good reading the Bible like that. That's authority right there, baby. I like it. Let's look what that verse says. Who's the they? The church. Christians, the early church, even amongst the persecution, and it wasn't convenient, and there was soccer and this and that going on, and everybody's busy, but here's what they did. They made this a priority. Look what it says. They continued, what's the adjective or the adverb it uses? What is it? Steadfastly. What does that mean? Good. What else? Unwavering. What else? Swiftly. What? Swiftly? Swiftly? No. Yeah. What else? We can't end on swiftly. Come on. What else? No, no, no I'm, just, I'm just razzing you. What is it? No deviation. Yeah, they continued steadfastly. They would not turn to the right or to the left. They would not let anything keep them away from this. It was their focus. It was their attention. It was their desire. It was the impetus of what they were doing. Here's what it says. They continued steadfastly in a few things. What is it? Apostles' doctrine. That's Bible study. That's what we're doing right now. In fellowship. Oh, I love fellowship. That's what we do before church, common grounds. It's what we do after church when we have lunch together. Wish today was a lunch day, but it's not. Next Sunday is. Uh, it's what we do in our mission groups. It's what we did in summer nights. We do life together. They continued steadfastly in the teaching of the Bible and in fellowship. And then look at this. In the breaking of bread. What is that? Eating. Eating, just having a meal together. God's design, God's will, God's purpose, God's desire for us. Also includes communion. Communing with each other and communing with Christ in unity. How beautiful it is when the brethren dwell together in unity, the Bible says. And then in prayers. Those are the things that God wants us to be uh, just going on. That's, that's what he wants us to be. We were designed for that. It's gospel-centered community. It's gospel-centered living. It's gospel-centered fellowship. It means that the goodness and favor of Jesus Christ, we get together and we just support each other and hold each other up. And that's what Paul received. He got the right hand of fellowship. And it strengthened him to no end. God's will, God's desire. Our need, our, our need for fellowship is encoded in our DNA. It's just part of who we are. And I tell you, if you take a look at the, around in the world, if you're not a Christian, it doesn't mean if you're not in fellowship. For those of you who aren't in, be, belonging to a mission group, here's what I know. You'll get it somewhere else. You'll get it somewhere else. Take a look around at the world, and here's what you'll see. The world is going to bars. They're going to clubs. They're going to parties. They're going to charger games. They're going to concerts. As a matter of fact, the NFL as a whole is profiting off of this DNA makeup that God has made us to desire fellowship. You ever been to a charger game? What happens? We all get there early. We all hang out in the parking lot. We all, why? Because we were designed for, say it with me, 
fellowship. We were designed for fellowship. God designed you for fellowship. And you were made for it. The early church always gathered in fellowship. And here's what we see. If you're not gathering in gospel-centered fellowship, you'll gather in some other kind of fellowship. You will. Because you were made for it. Without Jesus, man gropes around in the dark, going to bars, going to clubs, going to concerts, trying to find, trying to fill his intrinsic need for fellowship. Jesus looked at the multitudes, and what did he, what, what, what does the Bible say? Jesus looked at the multitudes, and he was filled with compassion. Why? Because they were like sheep without a shepherd. Next time you go to a Charger game, and you look out at the stuff going on in the parking lot, Oh, I hope this verse comes to mind. Wow, they're just looking for fellowship. They're just looking for unity. They want to really champion something together. And the best they can muster is the Chargers. (laughs) Hey, no offense, Charger fans, but when the icon of what you hold up, San Diego doesn't have the best sports team sometimes, you know. And, And if you're... Building your fellowship on that. Hey, I love the Padres. Even, you know, I, no matter what. Uh, my, my son Jordan, he's an avid sports fan. And one thing I love about him is, hey, rain or shine, he's a fair weather fan. I mean, he's, a, he's not a fair weather fan. He's a supporter. But think about it. When, when all you gather around is something that really isn't that valuable, What happens? Take it or leave it. Yeah, you don't have to buy this. This isn't the Bible, but this is just Dave, so take this. It's probably worth nothing. But I've noticed that virtually all fellowship is centered around one, or one of two things. It's either centered around alcohol or Jesus Christ. Just think about it. Virtually all fellowship is centered around one of two things, either alcohol or Jesus Christ. The Bible says, do not be drunk with wine, which leads to destruction, to dissipation, to ruin, but be filled with the Holy Spirit. Hey, what is the center of your fellowship? Is it alcohol? Yeah, we're having some friends over, and we're going to have, you know, I got some wine, got some beers. Really? Is that the centerpiece of your fellowship? Because when the centerpiece of your fellowship is alcohol, here's what I've noticed. We can't really have a good time without alcohol. I told my boys, if any of you have seen my boys out in, in uh, social circles, they like to have fun. And Nathan and, and Ryan and Mariah, they've never once gotten drunk. Never had a beer. And here's what I tell them all the time. How many, I say, hey, here's what I love about you guys. In, you guys are having so much fun that the world, that, that, that's a, that glorifies Jesus. You can be crazy, you can do weird things, you can dance like you guys dance and you look ridiculous <laughs> to the glory of Jesus Christ. Because you know what the world thinks when they see them? Wow, those guys are really drunk. <laughs> and they haven't even had a beer. And then they realize that and they go, wow, how can you have that much fun without being drunk? And it's a witness to the glory of Jesus Christ. Hey, I'm not, my family's not perfect. I I hope it it doesn't sound, I'm not boasting in anything but Jesus Christ. Is that understood? I hope that didn't come across the wrong way as self-righteous. I don't mean it to be. But here's what I've noticed. The world gathers for fellowship around one of two things, either alcohol or Jesus. And here's what I've seen. When drinking buddies gather together, what they love is not you. What they love is drinking or smoking pot or taking whatever. And the moment that you quit drinking, guess what happens to all your drinking buddies? Because they were never, it's fake, it's fake. And how important this fellowship is. 
Fellowship is amazing. It does some things. I'd like you to write down five points of what godly fellowship does. Godly fellowship, number one, it nourishes the soul. Nourishes the soul. It brings great joy. It brings fun. It brings laughter. It brings love into our lives. Wednesday night, um, we had uh, Craig and Cheryl, who just moved to Colorado, to, uh, talk to Craig this morning, uh, just moved to Colorado. We had a, uh, a kickoff for them on Wednesday night, and, and just a bunch of you were, were there. Uh, Scott and Sherry uh, opened up their home, and we just had a really nice event, had a nice meal together. And then after we just hung out and had fun, had a meal together, we sat around and, and uh, we just had a time of shout outs of how Craig and Cheryl have blessed our lives, things that we love about them. And I tell you what, it was special. It was special. It was edifying. It was rich. There was so much love. And we all left going just like, man, that was amazing. That was, that was just nourishing to the soul. And that's what good fellowship is. Yeah, it enriches our, our very person. It builds us up. After the shout out, we all got together and we had a time of prayer together. And that's just very naturally what the early church did. They gathered together for Bible study, to eat, to hang out, to love each other, and to pray together. And uh, boy, it just nourishes the soul when we do. The second thing that happens is it builds our person. It builds us. In other words, it makes us better. In other words, it develops us. In other words, it makes us become something that we would not have become if we were not in that fellowship. How so? Well, here's how. Because God has given you gifts. You have gifts that others do not have. And when you are with each other, these gifts operate like parts of the body, Paul said. So the kidney by itself is really not worth much. If kidneys were just laying around outside, we'd go, oh, those are disgusting. Can we get those in the trash? But when they get plugged into a body, they become vitally important. And what was once not really valued or very, very needed, now we go, oh my gosh, I, uh, that's super important to me. And that's who you are in the body of Christ. You have a function like a kidney or maybe you're a bladder. I don't know what you are, but you have a function that's very important. And you have gifts, and those gifts are amazing. And when you gather in fellowship, those gifts become exponentially more important. Let's say, for example, you have the gift of hospitality. And you can just make people feel amazing. You just welcome them in, and, and you know how to put a table together, and you know how to make the house feel warm. And if you are, have that gift and you're not in fellowship, yeah, uh, honey, I see the table set. Yeah, who's coming over? Nobody. Yeah, but you got the table set. Oh, I know, I just love doing this. Well, it looks kind of pointless. It's like a kidney being out on the road. Hey, we'll just, what, what good is that? What good is that? And so, so important, we grow. Your gifts bless me. And I learn from being with you. And others have gifts. And when you're with them, their gifts will bless you. Uh, again, Wednesday night when we were together, uh, Craig and Cheryl, you know, sending them off and just loving on them. Cheryl, for those of you who knew her, you know, she was uh, soft-spoken. Uh, I don't mean this in a derogatory sense, but just in a way of trying to describe. She's a bit of a wallflower, kind of quiet, soft-spoken, gentle spirit. Um, a lovely, lovely woman. And as we were all giving shout-outs and just saying, oh, Craig, you blessed me so much with this, and Cheryl, and here's what I noticed. There were a couple of gals uh, uh, who said, Cheryl, I have learned from your quiet and gentle spirit. And one of those women was Sherry. And Sherry is a, a strong, leading, powerful woman. She ran for state assembly. 
And here is a gifted, powerful woman, a, a leader of women. And here is Cheryl, meek and, and, and humble and, and mild. And this woman in her shout out goes, Cheryl, I've learned so much from you. And as a matter of fact, you've modeled things for me that I want to emulate. Oh my goodness. I was sitting there watching as a, you know, just as, as their friend going, yes, Lord, you are so good. Because I guarantee you, Cheryl didn't properly value those things in her own life. And now she sees what a powerful witness they are and how God is using them to reveal the glory of Jesus Christ. Humility is an attractive quality. And here's what I know about our gifts. When we have our gifts, we're prone to not value them very much. We're prone to think our gifts really aren't that great. And we get plugged into fellowship, and here's what we see. Wow, I actually, God, God can use me. God has a plan and a calling on my life. Everybody say this. God wants to use my life. All right, now I'm going to ask you to say it like you really believe it. Think about it for a moment. Think about what you just said and say it out loud with me again. God wants to use my life. Wow, really? You know what that does? That makes you very valuable to God. That makes you very valuable to others. That makes you very valuable in this world. We're going to pray for Danielle after service today. And she's going to go into the hospital tomorrow for surgery. And as we were praying outside this morning for her, here's what I was reminded, here's what I remembered. We have hospitals all over the place. And we have hundreds, even thousands of doctors, all ministering to the physical. For the X amount of percentage of people who have a sickness. But you know what I know? All of us have a spiritual need, a spiritual sickness, even spiritual death, until we come to Jesus Christ. And Jesus is the great physician, and you are the ones that he gifts who says, Jan, I want you to do an operation right over here. Here's a brother, a sister who's hurting. Jeff, you're my man. On the job site today, you're going to run into, and you're going to be my hands, and you're going to be my feet, you're going to be my scalpel, you're going to bring life, you're going to cut away what's killing, and you're going to bring life, health, and wellness. And you know what happens? We grow. It builds our person, and we realize that there's more to life. Man does not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. Is this connecting? Does this make sense? Say amen if this is connecting with you. There is life. When God begins to use you, oh my goodness, how amazing it is. Paul was so encouraged by the fellowship of Peter, James, and John, and it restored him. Living for ourselves, we decay and we begin to unravel at the seams. And we grow increasingly selfish and unsatisfied. And ultimately, loneliness will come in. But when we gather for fellowship, we realize, wow, the gifts of others really bless me. And my gifts are important to others. And we begin to have purpose in life and we begin to grow. The third point is just that. I've already hit on it, but it, uh, it not only builds our, our person, but gives us purpose. God wants to use you. God wants to do amazing things with you. And it's through fellowship that our gifts begin to surface. Some of you are maybe sitting here going, you know, I really don't know what my gifts are. Well, I would encourage you, get plugged in into a mission group. We launch our mission groups in the week of September 18th. We're going to have new groups. Uh, We'll be announcing more about this in the weeks to come. But get plugged in, and here's what will happen. You will begin to discover how valuable your gifts are. You'll begin to just see how important they are to the body of Christ. And the the gifts that Jesus gives us, you've heard me say this before. You know, at Christmas time, we get gifts, and who's the gifts for? 
Oh, oh, Carol, here's the gift. It's for you. It's a shirt. I hope you like it. It's to make you look amazing. You always do, by the way. But God gives gifts differently. He says, Carol, here's a gift. It's for everyone else. And I want you to have it. And he wants our gifts. Uh, uh, my teaching gift is not for me. It's for you. It has nothing to do with me. It's for you. Your gift is not for you. It's for me. And together we come together and, wow, it just gives us purpose. I know I have a purpose in God's kingdom. You have an equal or greater purpose in God's kingdom. And uh, it's through uh, fellowship and using our gifts that we discover that. Um, I know that some of you are just amazingly generous. Some of you have wisdom. Some of you have the ability to just help others. You just come along and you just love helping. Someone spills their purse and you're the first one down there to just help them pick it up. And someone, you just love helping. It's a great gift. Some of you have a teaching gift. Some of you have the gift of encouragement. Some of you are so winsome. Oh, I desire that gift. I just love winsome people. And in fellowship, these gifts come out. Some of you have the gift of encouragement. Some of you have the gift of administration. Here's what happens. These gifts nourish the soul. They build our per person, and they give us per purpose. Fourthly, and most importantly, and uh, if we could shine all the attention on this one, they glorify Jesus Christ. They glorify Jesus. Oh, it's amazing when we come together and we have Corey lead us in worship and we all just come before the throne. What's he doing? He's just using our gift to go, oh, Jesus, you're so amazing. I am seeing you. I'm thinking about you. I'm, I'm, I'm thinking about who you are, Jesus as Corey uses his gift. They glorify Jesus. These gifts, they come together, and, and it's just amazing to watch it work. The Bible calls it koinonia. That's the Greek word. There's not really an English equivalent. It means a bond that is brought together that is something so much more than just on meeting. You know, we both like the same things. It's a bond of fellowship that, that is... Unique to God's people and God's people alone. A bond of fellowship that is built on a genuine love, a care for each other, a selfless commitment to each other. And I tell you, when the world sees it, they look at it and they marvel. The world looks at that kind of love that you gave our family, that you gave my son Nathan. They look at that and they go, that's amazing. I've never seen anything like it. There's people here at 6 in the morning. There's people here at midnight. And they're bringing food and they're bringing love. And we just walk by that room and we can feel the love just pouring out of the doorway. Yeah, they, they marvel and Jesus is glorified. I can't tell you how many times that I have seen God get a hold of people and they used to have a drinking problem, and they used to have a drug problem, and they come to Jesus Christ, and here's what they say. Yeah, all my buddies left. That's the kind of fellowship that the world has. But in Jesus Christ, we have a different kind of fellowship where no matter how much wrong you've done, no matter how much you've stumbled, no matter how much things, you're just loved. You're just loved. And the world looks at that and marvels. The early church, I want you to think about it. We've read in Acts 2 that they continued in Bible teaching and the apostles' doctrine, in fellowship, in the breaking of bread, and in prayers. And what happened? And the Lord added to the church daily such as should be saved. You know what happened? They grew. Even in the midst of persecution, the Jews were trying to well, you know, Saul, Paul, Saul, was trying to kill Christians. The Jews were trying to stamp out the church, and the church was growing. How amazing. How amazing. That is the power of fellowship. That is the power of the Holy Spirit moving together. Jesus said it this way, wherever what? Two 
or more are gathered together, there I am in the midst. It's God's will that we would be in fellowship. And so how incredible that even amidst amidst persecution, uh, they gathered for fellowship and they changed the world as as a result. One more verse on your screens, Acts 2. Let me hear you read this one. They continued daily with one accord in the temple and breaking bread from house to house. They ate their food with gladness and simplicity of heart, praising God and having favor with all the people. Do you know what that is? Fellowship. It's what the early church was known for, breaking bread from house to house. They come to church. They get teaching. They go hang out in mission groups. They do gospel-centered living together. And look what the rest of the verse says. The Lord added to the church daily those who are being saved. Um, they grew. They grew. God was glorified. Amazing. So here we see the, the, the it nur- fellowship. It nourishes our soul. It builds our person. It gives us purpose. It glorifies Jesus. And the fifth thing it does is, is it protects and corrects us. It protects and corrects us. Look at what happened. Look at verse 11. Now, when Peter had come to Antioch, Antioch is in Galatia. It was a a very wealthy uh, city. Uh, Christianity was uh, really growing there. As a matter of fact, the Bible tells us that Christians were first called Christians at Antioch. And Peter came from Jerusalem to check out all that was going on, to support it, to to build it. Uh, Let's look what happened. Uh, When Peter came to Antioch, Paul says, I withstood him to his face because he was to be... Because he was to be blamed. Um, We'll look at why in just a minute. But here's what happened. Peter was doing something wrong. And he comes to Antioch. And Paul says, hey, I I dealt with him on this. And notice what it says. How does he say he did it? I withstood him where? To his face. Not behind his back. Not to everyone else. Not to... Everybody at the baseball game, but directly to Peter. Here's what we know. Fellowship is not always fluffy. Does that make sense? Fellowship is more than just, yeah, let's just get together and go to a Charger game. That that is fellowship. Nothing wrong with that. But it's more than that. Fellowship is protective and corrective. And here uh, we're seeing how Peter had been used in Paul's life to really build and edify Paul. And now at another time, Paul is going to be used in Peter's life. And look what happened. Verse 12. Here's, Here's what Paul corrected him about. For before certain men came from James, they would eat with the Gentiles. But when they came... He, Peter, withdrew him and separated himself, fearing those who were of the circumcision, fearing those who were Jews. So look, circle the word before. Before certain men came from James. James sent, James was the leader of the church in Jerusalem, Jesus' half-brother. He was a pastor there. Uh, there was a lot of good work going on in Antioch. And James says, hey, you leaders, why don't you go and check out what is going on with Paul in Antioch and go check it out. And so James sent those guys down. And when he did, here's what happened. Peter, he quit hanging out with the Gentiles and he started only hanging out with the Jewish people, specifically the guys who came from Jerusalem, the church leaders. Wanting to be winsome, wanting to be powerful, wanting to impress the Jewish leaders, the guys from Jerusalem, the bigwigs, Peter began to play a duplicitous game. He began to be different than who he really was. And it is so important that we are the same in church as we are where? Everywhere else. Our leadership team has uh, uh, values that we hold on to as leaders. They're all biblical values. 
one of the, lead, the values that we hold on to is that we're the same person on stage as we are at home. The same person at church and at work. Not two different people. And here, Peter began to play a duplicitous game. He was different. And in, and in doing so, uh, it's not glorifying to Jesus. You know, Jesus was the same yesterday, today, and forever and always. Jesus was the same when he was hanging around drinkers and, and prostitutes as he was when he was hanging around religious people and church people. He was the same. And we're to be the same. And, and uh, Peter, he got caught up in a duplicitous game. He was not hanging out with the Gentiles. He was only hanging out with the Jews. Why do you think that might be happening? Why was Peter doing that? What do you think? Why would he be doing that? Diana, high fives. He was fearing man. He was wanting to please man. He was wanting to be important to man. He was wanting to be uh, successful to man. The fear of man, the Bible says, is a snare. The fear of God is the beginning of wisdom. And Peter, even Peter, got caught up in this. Isn't that crazy? Isn't that crazy? Look, let's look what goes on. Uh, verse 13. And the rest of the Jews also played the hypocrite with him, so that even Barnabas was carried away with their hypocrisy. Wow. Yeah, what we do matters, and what we do affects others, and you are always being a witness. You are always being a light. And the Bible says a little leaven leavens a whole lump. And here we see it began to spread even in the church. And uh, verse 14. But when I saw that they, who's they? Yeah, Peter and Barnabas and the others who just started acting like that. When they were not straightforward about the truth of the gospel, I said to Peter before them all. Uh, them all would be not everyone, but those who were all doing this. If you, being a Jew, live in the manner of, of the Gentiles and not as a Jew, why do you compel the Gentiles to live as the Jews? Here's what he's saying. He's saying, hey, look, if you guys are Jews and you've learned the power of Jesus, you've learned that you're saved by grace, why then are you going back to all this uh, the Jewish laws and, and acting like you have to be separate. In Acts 10, Peter had a vision that the sheet was brought down from heaven and there was all kinds of creep and gross things on there. Uh, there were some good things too. Pigs were on that blanket and, and Jesus said, hey, eat those, Peter. Praise the Lord. Aren't you glad Jesus said that? And there were all kinds of things on there and, and, and Jesus told Peter, Peter, I want you to eat all that stuff. And Peter's response, no, I can't do that. I've never eaten anything unclean. And he says, what I call clean, don't call unclean. And the very next thing is, God sends Peter, Cornelius, a Gentile, a godly guy who comes and receives Jesus. And Peter understands, wow, there is no separation between Jew and Gentile, all one thing. And here, even in spite of that amazingly powerful thing, look what happens. Peter comes back to living two different ways. Verse 15, Paul says, We who are Jews and not sinners of the Gentiles, we know that a man is not justified by works of the law. You can't be justified by works. You can't, we're not just, but we're justified by faith in Jesus Christ. We're made right in Jesus even we have believed in Christ Jesus that we might be justified by faith in Christ and not by the works of the law. Isn't that great news? We're justified by faith in Jesus and not by what we do. For by works of the law, say it with me, no flesh shall be justified. Peter, what are you doing? Why are you making it look like You've got to live this 
Jewish lifestyle with all these rules, and you won't do eat this food, and you'll only have... And Paul gives him a pretty severe warning in verse 17. If while we seek to be justified by Christ, we ourselves are found sinners, is Christ therefore a minister of sin? Certainly not. Here's a warning. For if I build again those things which I destroyed, what did he destroy? Righteousness by performance. Righteousness by by keeping rules. Righteousness by being a good boy or a good girl. Righteousness by not sinning, by not messing up. Paul says, I I destroy that. If I build again the things which I destroyed, righteousness by performance, I make myself a transgressor, a transgressor against Jesus. That's a dangerous place to be. The book of Hebrews is really all about that. Uh, Verse 19 For I, through the law, died to the law. What does that mean? I, through the law, died to the law. What does that mean? I, through the law, died to the law. You know what it means? It means that through the law, we became guilty of sin and worthy of judgment and dead. Through the law, we become guilty of sin, worthy of judgment, and deserving eternal separation from God. Through the law, I became dead to the law, that I might live to God. Look at this. I have been crucified with Christ. All of my sin has been put on Jesus, and it has been crucified. I, all of my sin, has been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And the life that I now live in the flesh, this life that I live, I sin, I blow it, I mess up, I live by faith in the Son of God. Not my righteousness, but His. Don't have to earn God's favor, already have God's favor. I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave Himself for me. How incredible. The gospel. Verse 21, I want you to hold on to this. Read it with me. I do not set aside the grace of God. If you have the King James Version, it says it this way, and I love this. I do not frustrate the grace of God. What does it mean to frustrate the grace of God? What does it mean to set aside the grace of God? It means that we try to be righteous by what? Ourself. The moment you go, oh, I can't believe I did that. I'm so messed up. Guess what you're doing? Frustrating the grace of God. God says, what do you mean you can't believe you did that? Do you know who you are? Do you know how sinful you are? Do you know what is in you by yourself? And if I wasn't with you, do you know what you would be running them up to? And you can't believe you did that? Don't frustrate my grace. You can only frustrate the grace of God by not allowing it to pour freely into your life. It's the only way you can frustrate the grace of God. The only way you can set aside the grace of God is by not allowing it to flow freely into your life. Look what he says. I do not set aside, I do not frustrate the grace of God, for if righteousness came through the law, then Jesus died in vain. Wow. Wow. Godly fellowship protects us and corrects us, and it keeps us on track. Paul needed it. Peter needed it. Needed it. Fellowship is not always fluffy. There are times when we get together and, hey, you, you're going to have to pull a brother or sister aside and say, hey, 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 wait a second. That's the wrong track. You don't want to go back to that. That's what we left. Why are you desiring to go back to all the things that we left? Oh, Aaron, don't go back to what we left. Come, come, let's walk together. This is God's best. Yeah, fellowship is not always fluffy, but it's always building, edifying, restoring, giving me purpose, and equipping us for all that God has. How great to know that our sin has been dumped on Jesus Christ. How great to know that our sin has been nailed 
to the cross as it was put upon Jesus personally. He took our punishment and we are free. No shame, no fear, no condemnation. Without even knowing it, without even knowing it, Peter was starting to walk away from that very subtly. Departure always happens very subtly. And Paul came and restored him and brought him back. The last point that I want to leave you with is this. Everyone needs fellowship. Even Peter. Even Peter. Even Barnabas. Everyone needs fellowship. We are never too spiritual for fellowship. Even the apostles needed fellowship. And I know some of you are saying, well, I've been a Christian a long time. I don't really need a mission group. I've read my Bible five times. Well, good. Come to a mission group and bless everybody else with your plethora of wisdom. Maybe it's not about you. Maybe it's about you pouring into others because Jesus was a servant of all and he asked us to be, what? A servant of all. And so may we realize God's amazing plan, just how good the Lord is. May we hold on to all that he has for us. The Bible is just a book that says, hey, I want you to be in fellowship. Amazing blessings. The value of fellowship cannot be overstated. It nourishes the soul. It builds our person. It gives us purpose. It glorifies Jesus. And it protects us and corrects us and keeps us from going astray to the glory of God. Amen? Amen. Should we stand? Here's the question. What will you do with what you have heard? That was a good message. 